Good afternoon. My name is Craig Trudell. I'm the U.S. Auto Team Leader for Bloomberg News, based here in Detroit. Thank you for joining us. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce one of the busiest city CEOs in the automotive industry. He'll be hustling even harder in 2017, because in addition to serving as chairman and CEO of Nissan in Japan and Renault in France, He's also recently added the title of chairman of Mitsubishi Motors. He's here to speak to you all about the forces reshaping our industry, and then I will have the privilege of asking him a few questions. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Carlos Ghosn. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. It's always Good to be back in Detroit, even if from time to time the weather conditions are a little bit tough. Um, I came to Detroit from the CES, and the exhibits at NIAS have some similarity to those we've seen in the Las Vegas convention. It's something we have come to expect from auto shows. Technology is now as important as the vehicles themselves. The concepts and products Nissan has unveiled at this year's NIAS are an illustration of this. Yesterday, we introduced the Rogue Sport to our SUV lineup, and this morning, we unveiled our new concept design, V-Motion 2.0. It's our vision of how connected technology can be combined with good design. It's much more than a changing approach to auto shows. It's reflective of a changing industry. We'll see more change in the next 10 years than we have in the last 50. Automakers are expected to deliver technologies and business innovation while still meeting the classic expectation of our customers. This will be a critical competitive advantage for the future, and it's where automakers will be focused for 2017 and beyond. But before we look forward, let us look at where we are and where we have been. 2016 was a milestone year for the automotive industry. And it was a record year for Nissan also in the United States. We surpassed 1.5 million vehicle sales for the second consecutive year, 5.4% growth year over year. Now Nissan is the fastest growing automotive brand in the country. We have 10% market share in our sites. The US is an important market for Nissan and the key performance center. We have a 33-year history of investing in the U.S. and with its workforce with 22,000 employees today. Our plant in Smyrna, Tennessee is not only the largest Nissan plant in North America, it is the largest industry plant in North America, and it is at full capacity with 642,000 cars produced in 2016. Our growth has been driven by the consumer shift from cars to trucks and SUVs. This morning, our Titan was in the running for truck of the year. That is the picture of the US market. Globally, we expect next year will be another record-breaking year for the auto industry. But more than sales, the story of 2017 will be the significant technological advancements and business disruption. These changes are being shaped by four trends. First. 2016 was a tipping point for electric cars. Almost every major automaker has announced plans to develop EVs. Last year, EV sales were up 60% globally, and some analysts see more than 25% of new vehicles in urban regions sold as EV by 2030. This was not a prediction many would have made six years ago when Nissan introduced LEAF as the first affordable electric vehicle. Since 2010, more than 250,000 of these cars have been sold. It is the best-selling EV in the world. And last week at CES, we announced that its successor will be coming soon with autonomous drive functionality. Which brings us to the second trend, which are the auto autonomous technologies. Autonomous city driving is now expected to be a reality by 2020. The Renault-Nissan Alliance is on track with plans to launch 10 models with autonomous drive functionality in this time frame. The building blocks are in place. Our first model with ProPilot technology 
the Serena minivan is already on the roads in Japan today. ProPilot is Nissan technology that allows for autonomous driving within a single lane on highways. So far, 60% of Serena buyers have paid for this option. We, we plan to expand it to other products, obviously, including the new Leaf. We are also seeing advancements that will make cars smarter and able to make decisions in the range of driving environments. Last week at CES, Nissan unveiled a new technology, Seamless Autonomous Mobility, or SAM. Developed with NASA technology, SAM combines the artificial intelligence of millions of vehicles and the collective artificial intelligence in the cloud to increase safety, efficiency, and convenience for all kinds of transportation. It will enable more autonomous vehicles such as robo-taxis or robo-delivery to be on the road much sooner. The third trend we are seeing is that the vehicle is moving quickly from a single form of transportation to a mobile connected space. The Alliance is working with Microsoft to develop the next generation of connected car technologies. We are focused on technologies that will make the drive more productive and more enjoyable, such as the Microsoft personal assistant technology Cortana. The fourth trend is the emergence of new mobility services from robo-vehicles to new car sharing models. By 2030, one fourth of miles will be traveled via shared transportation. Right now, it's about 4%. So what does this change mean for automakers? These are those who believe that as mobility services increase, the car will simply become a commodity relegating automakers to the role of manufacturing transportation appliances. But at Nissan, we believe the opposite. There is a vast opportunity to deliver mobility services that are convenient and affordable and meet a wide range of customer needs. For example, we know that it is not a rational decision for everyone to own a car. Nissan recently launched a social platform in Europe to match owners to co-own a micro. And last week, we announced Nissan is leading an alliance engagement with Japanese internet company DNA to begin tests to develop driverless vehicles for commercial services such as ride hailing. But we remain confident about our core business of building cars for people who love to drive them and own them. This is an era of experimentation for every automaker. For Nissan, we have an advantage because with the addition of Mitsubishi Motors, the Renault-Nissan Alliance is reaching annual sales of 10 million, putting us among the top three automotive group in the world. This scale means we are able to invest in the full spectrum of autonomous, electric, connected technology and mobility services. No shortcut, no blind spots. There are still many unanswered questions about the future, but one thing is certain, the transition to our future roads our future cars and future mobility is already underway. As an industry, we have two choices. We can allow others to take the lead, or we can step up to own the new future of personalized transportation. We obviously have selected the second path. But we cannot do it at all at once, and we cannot do it alone. We must work alongside technology companies, startups, traditional automotive suppliers, government agencies and others. We recently announced Nissan would become the first automaker to join with the global nonprofit 100 resilient cities pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation to help cities lay the groundwork for new mobility technologies and services. These types of partnerships will become more and more critical. But most importantly, we must listen to what our customers want because for us, a confident, safe, and exciting drive is still the most important goal. And at Nissan, it is what we will continue to deliver. Thank you for your attention. Thank Greg, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so Mr. Gohn, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I mentioned in, in my introduction you're a busy man, so I'll get right to it. Uh, I was a bit taken aback to hear you say recently that you can't foresee in detail 
the future of our industry. So as you look out five years, what are you having the most trouble with? Well, I, I think one of the reasons for which we cannot see really in detail what's going to happen to the industry is not only because it doesn't depend only on us, but because this future depends so much on interaction with so many partners. And when you see the speed at which technology evolve, plus the multiplication of the constraint of the industry uh, from emissions from one side to the necessity of having the appropriate infrastructure to allow the technology to give their full uh, impact, you can understand that the biggest unknown is the speed at which all these technology are going to really come to mass marketing. Obviously, having a prototype is very easy, and that's why a lot of people are confused. They say, well, you know, you're working on robo-taxi, but we've seen lately on the TV that there are already robo-taxi in one specific place on the planet. Uh, making prototypes is very easy. We have prototypes of every kind of prototypes. I've, I've driven an A3, what we call an A3 autonomous car in Palo Alto last week. It's working perfectly. But moving this particular technology, which is today ready for prototype in one particular city, moving it to mass marketing is going to take us four years. So moving from what you know how to do to something which is mass marketing takes a lot of time, on top of the fact that we need to persuade, in many countries, different regulators to accept what you're offering to the market and to regulate what you're offering to the market. That's, in my opinion, the biggest unknown. At what speed we're going to be able to introduce this technology, at what speed the regulator are going to accept, and at what speed, in fact, your suppliers and your partners will be able to solve the many problems you're putting in front of them. Well, and what about the, the confidence that at the end of that four or five year journey that the customer is actually going to want it? Oh, I, I mean, obviously we all have our own beliefs, but uh, when it comes to autonomous transportation, and again, I don't want to confuse anybody, autonomous transportation is not a car without a driver. Autonomous transportation is the car with the driver, but the driver decide when he wants to drive and when he doesn't want to drive. That's autonomous transportation. The rest is driverless cars. Autonomous transportation is a huge benefit for the driver. A huge benefit. For, because, in fact, you are empowering the driver. And you are, the driver decides whenever he wants to drive or not. And then with the connected car, he can decide whenever he doesn't want to drive that he wants to do something else. Um, we made it, obviously, all our market intelligence showing a huge interest from the consumer. But we made the real-time test in Japan with the Serena minivan that I mentioned in my speech. We put an option on the Serena, which is paid a little bit more than 100,000 yen, which is approximately $1,000, and uh, where the consumer have to pay $1,000 to have the functionality of one-lane highway autonomous drive. 60% of the people have bought it. So they at, at, yeah, at the beginning we said, okay, maybe 60% the first month because it's something new. <coughs> it's very attractive, but then it's going to go down. It didn't go down. It is still at 60%. And when we interview the people who are really driving with this functionality, they are telling us about all the benefits they see in it, and they consider it as a very big benefit. And this is a very marginal benefit from autonomous drive. So you can imagine when you're going to be able to switch off driving in a traffic jam in the city, uh, downtown, etc. I think it's going to be very big. So I have no doubt on the fact that at the end of the day, consumer will be buying into it. Well, and, and going back to that question about not being able to, to see with certainty, and given that we're flying a little bit blind here, uh, how should we think about the relative strengths and weaknesses of a, of a car maker like Nissan being able to deal with that versus a, a company like a, an Uber or a Google being able to deal with that? Yeah. Well, uh, look, we, we, don't, we don't pursue the same objective. First, we're not pursuing. And I don't think that, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're after the same thing. When, when you have a company like Uber, for example, they said very clearly that for them, a driverless car is a question of life or death. Because if they don't get to the technology of driverless cars and somebody else do, they are under threat. As you know, the bigger cost uh, of a taxi ride is a driver. So if, if somebody can eliminate the driver, 
they don't have a huge advantage. So they know it's possible, they want to be the first one to do it. So I can understand the huge motivation that a company like Uber has into saying, well, I need to be able to control this technology and put it to my service immediately. On top of this, as you know, their biggest concern is how fast they can grow, and the biggest limit to their growth is finding drivers. Okay, finding drivers from one side, competitive pressure coming from somebody bringing a car without a driver, you can understand why these guys are going after this. In our case, it's one option. We have many options in front of us. Driverless cars is one option, but autonomous cars at different levels are other, uh, other options. So our, our job is not only to be able to master the technology, but to be able to locate the technology in function of the different needs. Now, the big difference between Uber, Google, Apple, uh, and us is not only you need a car which is connected, you need a car which is autonomous, or we need a car without a driver, but let's not forget that we still need a car which is attractive, reliable, comfortable, driving very well. And let's not forget, because some people very quickly tell you, yeah, but you know, you're gonna, guys, you're gonna follow the, the path of the telephone, uh, the, the, the telephone industry. I mean, this is one of the most regulated products on the planet. You have so many regulation around the car. Mm. And all these regulations are making car making extremely complicated and extremely difficult. That's why I think it's different businesses. Uh, you know, at a certain point in time, we're going to be collaborating together. But at the end of the day, car makers are going to continue to bring this technology because this technology is an additional benefit. It's not going to substitute everything else. You may have taken a few questions today from people like me about this uh, new president that we have coming. So when we talk about sort of predicting the future of, of the car business, does it get any more difficult to predict under President Trump? You know, obviously, we, when, when, whenever there is a new administration coming, particularly in the second largest car market in the world, everybody's anxious and everybody listening. Because uh, a lot of things have already been announced. The things that have been announced, uh, frankly, are predictable because what uh, President-elect Trump, soon president, I think on the 20th of January, he said, America comes first and I want jobs in the United States. That's mainly what he said. Uh, so, frankly, there is, makes a lot of sense for us. We've seen it in many countries in the world where uh, people want to promote their own economy first and eventually they want to have the benefit of the market, the huge market that they have created. Obviously, our role is to make it in a way which is still competitive because we know that the consumer at the end of the day is not going to say, you know, ah, I agree that you do it and you're going to hack the, no, no, you want to do it in a competitive way. So. We don't want to preempt anything, we're waiting. That means soon we think we're going to have a lot of clarity and precision on the intention of the administration, even though we still have some ideas about what's going to happen. And frankly, I think all car makers will adapt to the new rules, if there are new rules. So far, the rules have been NAFTA. These are the official rules that govern the North American market, and we all adapted to it. Okay, there was an agreement was signed by the three countries, it was NAFTA. Obviously, it looks like after 20 years of January, it's not gonna be NAFTA, it's gonna be something else, fine. Whatever it is, we will adapt. That's what I wanna tell you. That means as long as the rules are the same for everybody, we will all adapt. Well, and, and after that election, we could all use maybe a little bit of positivity. Uh, what are some of the things that, that he could do to help uh, a Nissan which sells the leaf, my father-in-law won't let me get off the stage without asking you for the scoop about the 2018 Nissan Leaf. Uh, what, what could he do about infrastructure? Uh, could he make electric vehicles a part of his infrastructure plans or, no, or I, help I, with autonomous driving? I, I think, I think the, the only thing that reasonably can be expected from the new administration without going into the detail is to maintain consumer confidence high. That's it maintain consumer confidence high, which by the way is very high in January because uh, even though all the industry is saying 2016 has been a record year and we think 2017 is gonna be about the same than 2016, 
Well, it looks like 17 is going to be better than 2016. And particularly when you analyze all the measures that are going to be taken at the level of the economy, whatever it is, reducing the tax rate from, on companies from 35% to 15%, deregulating in some area which has been overregulated, all of this is going to go into direction of, in, in my opinion, boosting growth. So uh, I think maintaining consumer confidence high and boosting growth would be already a great thing for the industry. For the rest, we will adapt to everything. That means, you know, whatever, we want more environmentally friendly cars uh, or uh, more safety on the cars, etc. This industry is used to heavy technical challenge and we are here for that. So if, if there is a request, the request is let's keep consumer confidence high. Let's make sure the market will continue to be strong. I think we're running out of time, and I think you have a, a swarm of journalists waiting for you for round two. So thank you very much, and let's give Mr. Gona a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Gary.